everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. I will be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series on genetics. Now you probably noticed that my template has changed. I probably should have done that like two or three videos ago when we actually started talking about genetics, but I'm just now getting around to it. So know that we are not exactly in a new series, but we're kind of in a new series. We're going to start focusing on genetics. Our topic for today is complex inheritance. There's just one objective that I need you to be able to accomplish by the end of this video, and that is to compare and contrast situations that deviate from Mendel's law of inheritance. Before we actually get into our video today, let's talk about what Mendel's law of inheritance was. Just kind of a refresher from our past video that talked about his model of inheritance. So in Mendel's model, here's what we got. Two alleles for each trait, you've got a dominant allele or a recessive allele, that is all. One dominant allele, like I just said, one recessive allele, and everything is cut and dry, that's all there is to it. It's, you know, 50-50 chance of getting one or the other, one dominates over the other, boom, you're done. In reality, however, life is complex, so many genes do adhere to Mendel's Law, but there are a bunch of situations that do not. The rest of the video is going to be focused on those situations that do not adhere to Mendel's Law of Inheritance. Before we talk about the specific ones, we need to talk about what exactly is dominance. If we are talking about genes, dominance simply means that a trait or a gene is producing more of a substance. Let me back up and say that another way. Remember that a gene is all of the code to produce a specific polypeptide chain or a functioning protein. When you get two alleles for a gene, remember you get an allele from mom, allele from dad, they're different from each other. It's not like the dominant allele goes over and beats up the recessive allele and takes its lunch money and keeps it from working. The two alleles don't actually interact with each other. The two genes don't touch, they don't interact. It's just that the dominant allele produces more or causes the body to produce more of whatever protein is being produced from that allele than the recessive one. So let's say that you've got an allele that is, I don't know, for your flower to produce red pigment. The dominant allele causes the flower to produce more red pigment. The recessive allele causes it to produce less, so one dominates over the other. Just remember that in dominance, the genes aren't actually interacting. One just causes the body to produce, to produce more of something than the other. All right, specific situations, here we go. With this idea of dominance, we've got a couple different topics we need to talk about. So in Mendel's model, it's very simple. You have got dominant allele, you've got recessive allele. When they're together, dominant shows up over recessive, but it's not always so easy. One of the situations that is slightly more complex is incomplete dominance. In incomplete dominance, you don't really have one allele dominating over the other. A good example of this is flower color. Often in flowers or in uh, tests that relate to genetic problems like this, you will see one flower contributing a allele for red flower color and one flower contributing an allele for white flower color. Neither one of these dominates over the other. So what happens is if you cross the red flower with the flat white flower, you end up with a bunch of pink kids. So the red gene is being expressed, the white allele is being expressed, you end up with a blend that gives you pink flowers. So one doesn't win over the other. They give you a blended phenotype for the kids. So associate incomplete dominance with a new phenotype that isn't showing up in either of the parents. In codominance, you have both phenotypes of the parents showing up in the kids. So example of this would be right here, this flower. So same situation where you have got a red parent and a white parent. The kids have white petals and they have red petals. This is not the blended scenario that you get, you get with incomplete dominance. This is a genotype that shows both mom and dad. So just kind of get those associated. Incomplete dominance gives you a new phenotype, like they blend to make pink. Codominance, red and white show up on the same flower. Next situation to be aware of is called multiple alleles. The best example of this is blood type. For blood type, there are actually three alleles rather than the normal two. The alleles for blood type are A, B, and the recessive O. So if you get two A alleles, you end up with type A blood. If you get two Bs, you end up with type B blood. If you get two Os, you have got type 
O blood. And if you end up with an A and a B, you end up with type AB blood. Now, be aware that since this O is recessive, you can also have this situation, which gives you type A blood, and this situation, which gives you type B blood. So recognize that for a trait like blood type, there are more than the common two alleles in this case. There are three alleles that are coding for whatever trait is showing up in the individual. Then we've got pleiotropy. I don't even need to draw anything. This is summed up very nicely by this little diagram I've got right here. You have one gene that has multiple effects on the phenotype. Good example of this would be cystic fibrosis. You have got one gene broken that causes cystic fibrosis, but there are many effects in the body of the disease that is cystic fibrosis. You've got problems with muscles, you've got uh, mucus production issues, you've got problems with your lungs. So that one little gene is having multiple effects inside the body. Next up on our parade is epistasis, where you have one gene affecting another gene. Now I show you a mice, a mice, a mouse. I show you a mouse because they are the common case study for epistasis. In mice, here's what you see. There is one gene, we're going to call it gene B, that controls the actual pigment that is produced for the fur of the mouse. And then we've got another gene, we're going to say it's gene O, that controls whether that pigment is actually placed in the fur of the mouse or not. So it's possible you could have a situation where gene B produces the pigment for a black mouse all day long, but gene O is not present, so that pigment doesn't actually get put in the fur. In this case, you would have a mouse that is white, because even though the pigment's being made, it's not actually making it into the hair of the mouse. So epistasis, one gene is affecting the expression of another gene. Then we've got polygenic inheritance. This is probably one of the more common forms of inheritance that doesn't adhere to Mendel's laws, because polygenic inheritance is describing a situation where multiple genes affect one trait. So this would be things like skin color or eye color or hair color. The best way to tell if something is polygenic is whether it shows up along a spectrum. By a spectrum, I mean that there is a range of expression. So with color, we have got a range of expression all the way from super light skin to super dark skin. There are a bunch of genes or a bunch of alleles that function in skin color. And the more of an allele that produces melanin, that you get, the darker your skin is going to be. So if you get very few of the alleles that cause the body to produce melanin, you're going to have light skin. If you get quite a few, you're going to have darker skin. So there's a whole range in there. And based on how many of those alleles for melanin production you get, darker your skin is going to be. Eye color, there is a broad range of eye colors. And there are several genes that work on eye color that produce the pigments that give us, you know, brown eyes, blue eyes, green eyes, hazel eyes, violet eyes, gray eyes, whatever. So polygenic inheritance recognizes multiple genes acting on one trait, and there is usually some sort of spectrum that the trait is expressed across. Finally, last slide for the day, nature and nurture. We all know life is complex. Oftentimes things are much more I don't know, complicated than a simple gene says you will do this or you won't do that. A perfect example that's debated all the time is alcoholism. Um, there has been some research that has shown that there might be a genetic predisposition to being alcoholic, but also whether you end up being alcoholic or not is going to be in large part affected by the household situation that you grew up in, you know? So you've got a combination between genetic predisposition, but also in large part the sort of environment you grew up in. Much easier um, example of this is right there on the right hand side you see a hydrangea flower. Hydrangeas flowers range in color from white all the way to like purple and there's blue and pink and all kinds of stuff in between. Color of the flower depends on the acidity of the soil. So a certain um, I guess soil pH might give you purple flowers. Another Soil pH might give you white flowers, another one might give you pink. So in this case, you have got a gene for the color of the flowers, but the expression of that gene is being, I don't know, modified or affected by the pH of the soil. I hope that you were able to track with us as I went through all of those deviations from Mendel's Law. I appreciate you joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. Hopefully we'll see you again. Thank you.